Today at the National Press Club, Prime Minister Scott Morrison, as Australia grapples with COVID-19 and its first recession in nearly 30 years, he'll discuss his government's response ahead of next week's federal budget. Prime Minister Scott Morrison with today's National Press Club address. Good afternoon and welcome to the National Press Club of Australia. My name is Sabra Lane, I'm the club's president and welcome to today's Westpac address. Today, for the third time this year, the Prime Minister Scott Morrison is our guest and he's presenting the government's modern manufacturing policy. If you're following the discussion online, you'll find us on Twitter. Our user handle is at Press Club, AUST. Everybody, please join me in welcoming the Prime Minister Scott Morrison. Well, thank you very much, Sabra. It's good to be back here again at the Press Club in this all-important week leading up to next year's, next week's, I should say, budget. And uh, it's great to be joined by so many of my colleagues here today. Uh, the Deputy Prime Minister, of course, Michael McCormack, and I commend him on his tremendous speech he gave yesterday. The new Richard Mercer of, this, of Australian politics with his call for Australians to go bush and support with a harvest. Uh, I strongly endorse his comments yesterday. It's good to have uh, the Leader of the Government in the Senate, uh, Matthias Cormann. And uh, Matthias will be leaving us at the end of this year. Uh, they will be very big shoes to fill in our government. And uh, this will be his last budget. And uh, I want to thank you, Matthias, for the tremendous work you've done, not just on this budget, but the six prior to it. Uh, it has been a Herculean effort. And uh, today, the Treasurer is uh, still back there uh, with the sharpened pencil as he works through the final touches of the budget for next week. And I also want to thank the Treasurer for the tremendous job that he's been doing uh, together with Matthias Cormann to bring forward what will be a very important budget next week. To Karen Andrews, who joins us here today, um, what I'm presenting to you today is uh, absolutely the product of her, her labours over not just many weeks, but over, over many, many months. And I'm looking forward to presenting that today, Karen, and I, I thank you for your leadership in this area in particular. We're joined by other ministers, of, of course, as well. We have Keith Pitt in Resources and Energy and Angus Taylor in Energy, sorry, Resources and uh, Northern Australia. I haven't made any changes, Angus, don't worry. Or <laughs> Keith, um, you'll be pleased to know, nor do I intend to. Uh, they're both doing a tremendous job in all of those portfolios. They share an apartment together and they've got it absolutely cranking on all cylinders. And tomorrow you'll hear uh, in Sydney from the Assistant Minister Ben Morton who will be speaking more about the government's deregulation agenda. Can I begin? And I, can I um, also acknowledge Nev Power. I've just seen him here as chair of the uh, National COVID Commission. And, and uh, Nev, thank you for the great work that you've been doing uh, with the Commission. As you know, uh, together with Andrew Liveris, what we're speaking about today has been, an, uh, has been uh, importantly informed by the great work that you and your team have been doing in its previous and, and our, its new form. Can I be begin today by acknowledging the Ngunnawal people, of course, uh, their elders past, present and emerging for the future. Can I also, as is my custom, uh, to acknowledge and pay my respects to any veterans or serving members of the Australian Defence Forces uh, who are here with us today or joining us um, from outside this place and, and simply say on behalf of a grateful nation, thank you for your service to our country. The 2020-21 budget to be delivered by the Treasurer next Thursday will be arguably one of the most important, if not the most important, since the end of the Second World War. This year, the global economy is forecast to contract by around 4.5%. The world economy during the GFC declined by 0.1%. So in simple terms, the economic contraction we're expecting this year in the global economy is 45 times greater than the GFC. The scale of what is occurring today is incredibly sobering. Never before have we experienced a global recession of this magnitude in a truly modern, interconnected world and global economy, no longer insulated by geography and old technology. Global recessions now occur in real time. So this budget will be necessarily different in scale to those we have seen in many generations. It will respond responsibly to the challenge of our time and consistent with the principles that we laid down at the outset of the pandemic 
back in March. The budget will confirm the strong plan we have to recover from the COVID-19 recession and to build our economy for the future. To cushion the blow of the pandemic recession, to recover what has been lost, the jobs, the livelihoods, the hours, the incomes, the customers, the clients. But importantly, to take new ground by rebuilding our economy for the future. And we'll do this, importantly, while honouring our guarantee to the essential services that Australians rely on, the schools, the hospitals, Medicare, aged care, disability services. And we'll do it while keeping Australians safe and we'll do it without increasing taxes. That's what the 2020-2021 budget is all about. The work, though, is already underway. 2020, in a strong position. Unemployment was falling, more Australians were in jobs than ever before. The female participation rate at an all-time all -time high. More working age people were off welfare and into jobs. Our AAA credit rating had been secured and our budget was back in balance. This meant that as the pandemic hit, we could act quickly and confidently to cushion the blow. Treasury advises us that some 700,000 additional jobs would have been lost in measured unemployment were it not for the measures that the government undertook. JobKeeper, JobSeeker, cash flow support and many, many more. We are also working to recover what has been lost. 760,000 jobs that were either lost or reduced to zero hours as the COVID crisis hit have already come back into our economy. This is a great tribute to the resilience of Australians and the Australian economy, its fighting spirit. The Australians who make our economy work each and every day. Our effective unemployment rate has fallen from 14.9% as the crisis hit back to 9.3%. But that's not good enough. There are further risks, there are further challenges ahead, there are further unknowns. We are not through this yet, not by a long shot, and there is still much more to be done. And we are rebuilding our economy for the future through our job maker economic plan that I first spoke of right here at this platform. Our plan for affordable and reliable energy will secure our liquid fuel reserves and lower emissions. It will get the gas we need for manufacturing to succeed, for households to have more money in their pockets, to firm up the reliability of renewables like solar and wind and to transition our energy economy into the future. This transition will be guided by our comprehensive technology investment roadmap released by Angus Taylor recently to deliver reliable, scalable, lower cost, lower emissions technologies to underwrite our economy over the next 30 years and beyond. A plan not driven by taxes, but by technology. We're delivering lower taxes for businesses and individuals. Australians are already benefiting from the tax cuts made in the last two budgets. Just this year alone, in the billions, the small and medium-sized businesses tax rate has been cut to 26% and the instant asset write-off extended and expanded to investments of up to $150,000. Australians are keeping more of what they earn, as we promised they would, but there is still more to be done and there will be more next week. Major changes have been introduced to how we do skills training. Our $1 billion job trainer program with the states and territories is boosting the number of training places in this year alone by 340,000 places. That's good news for school leavers and those who are looking for those training places coming out of jobs. We have secured a new heads of agreement on skills reform, as I said we would do, with the states and territories through the national cabinet process to ensure Australians acquire the skills they need for the jobs that businesses need them to be able to do. National Skills Commission and Commissioner has been established to guide these investments, not just by the Commonwealth, but by the states and territories also. 
The government has committed $2.8 billion to keep up to 180,000 apprentices in this country on the tools at some 90,000 small and medium-sized businesses through to the end of March next year. And yesterday, the Education Minister, Dan Tien, announced an extra 12,000 places for students going to university next year to help them upskill and get job ready. We are working to fix the problems in our industrial relations system so we can employ more people. The Attorney General, Christian Porter, has brought unions and employer groups together in search of common ground to boost employment, to grow our economy. One thing is very clear from this process, and particularly recent events out at Port Botany, that we cannot afford business as usual in industrial relations. It keeps people out of jobs. We continue to bring forward record investments in infrastructure, in our three key infrastructure grids, as the Deputy Prime Minister well knows and leads that work. The transport grid, our water grid, and of course our energy grid. Major projects like the Inland Rail, Western Sydney Airport, the North South Connector in Adelaide, Stage 3A of the Gold Coast Light Rail in Queensland, the Bunbury Outer Ring Road in Western Australia. The $484 million Dungowan Dam project, where we're committing half those funds. In New South Wales, that'll increase storage capacity from 6.3 gigalitres to 22.5 gigalitres. Design, geotech and environmental assessments, they're already underway at the site. And then there's the EMU Swamp Dam, finally. A 12 megalitre irrigation dam and water supply scheme on the Severn River in Queensland. It's under construction. Boots and utes on the ground. We are working with the states to accelerate the critical energy infrastructure identified in the AEMO Integrated System Plan. We're bringing forward projects like Mariner Slim, VNI West and Project Energy Connect by at least 12 months. It's creating over 4,000 jobs and helping ensure reliable, affordable energy for families and for businesses to create jobs. We're making it easier for business to do business, cutting red tape, streamlining approvals, particularly for major projects, including our new single-touch approvals reform under the EPBC Act. Our digital plan, I announced with the Treasurer earlier this week, will upgrade, our, will upgrade the circuit boards of our economy, making it safer and easier to get paid, to make payments, to connect with customers and to deal with government. It will drive uptake of digital technologies across businesses that will in turn boost productivity, innovation, especially vital for our manufacturing sector, which is our topic today. That plan brings together some $7 billion of investments in cyber security, NBN, 5G applications, digital skills capability, reg tech, fintech, open banking, consumer data rights, many things that I, I suspect people looking on today will not be familiar with, but they're going to make a big difference to how business operates in this country in this new age. Assistant Minister Morton, as I said, will be outlining further changes tomorrow a further update on the work of the deregulation task force he leads on my behalf. We're continuing to prize open, of course, new markets for Australian businesses overseas. That work hasn't stopped. More than 70% of all of our two-way trade is now covered by export agreements. That compares to just 26% when we came to government. This is giving Australian companies preferential access to more overseas markets. But we're not just stopping there. Second round access discussions as part of the UK FTA negotiations, they're underway this week. Our EU FTA negotiations are continuing. Our landmark deal with Indonesia, uh, Indonesia has come into force and we've set a new benchmark for digital economy agreements with our high quality deal with Singapore. More affordable and reliable energy. More effective and better resource skills training and development. Lower taxes boosting infrastructure investment in our water, energy and transport grids, cutting red tape and making it easier to do business, fixing problems in our industrial relations system to get more people into jobs, opening up access to more overseas markets for Australian exporters. That's our plan. Our economic response has meant that despite the hardships that Australians have suffered, Australia is still one of just a handful of economies, along with South Korea, Taiwan, Norway, leading the world in both the economic and the health response to the pandemic. 
our June quarter contraction of 7%, which hit hard. We must remember, compares to falls of more than 20% in the United Kingdom, falls of more than 10% in Canada, New Zealand, Italy, and France, and falls of almost 10% in Japan, the United States, Germany, and the OECD on average as a whole. Today, I want to talk about our job maker plan for the future of manufacturing in Australia. We make things in Australia. We make them well. We do it well. And we need to keep making them in Australia. Under, under our plan, we will. Manufacturing employs some 860,000 Australians. And prior to the pandemic, it generated more than $100 billion in value for our economy each year and over $50 billion in exports. It is also a large driver of research and development. Manufacturing contributes around a quarter of total investment, R&D investment in Australia, roughly four times its share of the economy. Manufacturing is particularly important to regional economies in places like the Hunter, North and Central Queensland, Tasmania, regional Victoria. Our recent decades in time, our manufacturers have largely moved on from the mass production of standardised goods. Long gone are the days of trying to compete with labour-intensive, low-cost manufacturing economies. Gone too are any pretensions of protectionism as a viable strategy for domestic manufacturing. That's not where our future is. Manufacturing in Australia today has been transformed and will continue to transform. It's more agile, it's more dynamic, and it's less monolithic. Today's advanced manufacturing enterprises stretch from the labs doing the research and development, the skilled workers doing the design and engineering, through to sales, marketing, and after sales services. Increasingly, this is where most of the value is created. Around half of the jobs in manufacturing are actually in these parts of the manufacturing process. Even the assembly line is changing through the increased use of intelligent robotics and 3D printing. We need a deeper appreciation that advanced manufacturing is not just about what we make, it's about how we make it, how we sell our products domestically and internationally. So, what's to be done? Now, as an accomplished engineer before she entered Parliament, Karen Andrews, our Minister for Industry, Science and Technology, has taken up this mission, this question, with great gusto and has provided the leadership for the strategy I'm outlining to you today. And I thank her for her work, as I also thank uh, and recognise the role of the National COVID Coordination Commission's Manufacturing Task Force, led by Andrew Liberis. Under Andrew's guidance, the task force has consulted widely and provided practical advice to inform our work, including valuable insights from best practice overseas, where he's had great involvement. So to our modern manufacturing strategy, the objective is to build scale and capture income in high value areas of manufacturing where Australia either has established competitive strength or emerging priorities. This will require our manufacturing sector to be even more productive and highly skilled, to be more collaborative at the leading edge of R&D, commercialisation and technology adoption, to be more outward looking in searching relentlessly for footholds in global markets. At a government level, we must first understand that a successful manufacturing sector will depend on broader economic policies that support greater productivity. Again, affordable and reliable energy, lower taxes, industrial relations changes, training and skills development, cutting red tape, infrastructure investment. All of this supports manufacturing. And there's more. Too often in the past, industry policy has ignored these foundational elements in the vain hope that isolated programs, subsidies and workarounds could make up for the broader deficiencies in the broader economic policy settings. We also need to get more targeted and apply greater discipline to how we invest in these sectors as a government. It must be part of longer term planning. Our government is determined to set a 10-year time horizon under this strategy where all parties, industry, workforce, including unions, government at all levels, capital, including superannuation funds, 
and our scientific and research community are all pulling together in the one direction. Our practical strategy has three components. Firstly, create a business environment where our manufacturers can be more competitive. Secondly, to align resources to build scale in areas of competitive strength. And thirdly, to secure sovereign capability in areas of national interests. That's our plan. And we'll be investing an additional $1.5 billion in specific industry measures over and above what we'll be doing in tax and energy and infrastructure and the like to back our plan in in next week's budget. Now, firstly, creating a business environment in Australia where our manufacturers can be more competitive. That's foundational, as I've said. You can invest all the resources you like in industry programs, but if taxes are too high, if industrial relations systems are too complicated, if the adoption of uh, t digital technology is patchy, if energy is too expensive, if approvals take too long and are too costly, if the roads are clogged and employees don't have the right skills, and you're shut out of overseas markets, well, you're wasting your time. That's why the, all of those things and correcting all of those things is so important. For manufacturing to be successful in Australia, all manufacturers, we must become a more competitive place for manufacturers to do business. Whether it's in aluminium smelting in Gladstone, steel processing in Port Kembla and Whaler, ethanol production at Shoalhaven Heads down on the south coast, fertiliser production in Mount Isa, aerospace at Fisherman's Bend for Boeing, or ships at Port Adelaide and Henderson in Western Australia. And that's what our job maker plan is all about, creating the right incentives and enablers for businesses to compete so they can create more jobs and keep more Australians employed. Our broader job maker plan is the foundation of our manufacturing strategy, benefiting all manufacturers, especially when it comes to tax incentives for investment, energy, skills, R&D and technology. Now, the Treasurer will have more to say about those particular issues next week, especially when it comes to investment and R&D incentives. So I'll not touch on those issues today. In a manufacturing context, it's especially important to highlight the necessity of our efforts to create a competitive domestic gas market. Now, the NCCC advised us that gas is up to 40% of many industries' cost structures in manufacturing. Now, combined with higher electricity costs, the NCCC said that that has moved many firms into what they call a doom loop, where they are living turnaround to turnaround, making existential decisions about their operations at each point of the next major maintenance decision, rather than decisions where they prefer to be making in technology and much needed productivity improvements to to remain competitive and to build their business for the future. Now that needs to change. That is why as part of our gas-fired recovery plan, we have committed to resetting our East Coast gas markets, unlocking gas supplies, establishing a new gas hub and improving our gas grid distribution systems. If you're not for gas, you're not for manufacturing and heavy industry in this country and the jobs that they support. For many manufacturers, gas is half the problem that they confront. And that's why reforming that sector is so foundational to the achievements we hope for in the manufacturing sector. Now, the second component is to align our resources to build scale in areas of competitive strength. The reality is we cannot and should not seek to reach global scale in a large number of sectors. We can't be all things to all people. This is an important lesson from other small and I'd say medium-sized, high-income economies like ours, which have leveraged homegrown manufacturing into global success. This has happened in Singapore, the UK, Germany, Canada, all circumstances and, and areas that we've looked at. The lessons don't try to do everything. It's all about alignment across levels of government, with industry and with research and education sectors, and siloed programs don't work. Against that backdrop, the government has identified six national manufacturing priorities in areas of established strength and emerging priority. They are the resources technology and critical minerals processing, food and beverage manufacturing, medical products, clean energy and recycling, defence industry and the space industry. 
As the world's leading mining economy, Australia can capture Mintech and critical minerals processing based on our natural resource endowment, our high school workforce and world-class technological capability. And I particularly welcome the announcements made today by BHP to that end. They've set, I think, a leading standard. Australia's mining, equipment, technology and services sector, the MET sector, already plays a key role in adding value beyond resource extraction in the mining supply chain. At the same time, we know demand is increasing for critical minerals, their inputs to batteries and renewable technologies and other manufactured materials from partners like Japan, the United States and Europe providing us with opportunities to just move up that value chain. Food and beverage manufacturing, like Bickford's down there in South Australia, one of the fastest growing parts of our manufacturing sector in recent years and the largest employer in our manufacturing sector. It's the second area of our focus as part of this strategy. Australia's status as a leading agricultural producer with a premium reputation for safe, clean produce gives us a real edge here, a vital edge. Thirdly, the COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted our gold standard health and medical research and manufacturing capability. It provides a key platform for commercialising new medicine and medical product breakthroughs right here in Australia. Firms such as Cochlear, CSL, ResMed have shown what can be achieved when you combine high quality manufacturing major investment in commercialising great ideas and a global outlook, supported critically by world-class primary research and stringent regulatory to, uh, framework to support it. All of those firms, particularly CSL, playing such a critical role as we respond uh, to the COVID crisis. Then there's clean energy and recycling, an important part of the government's broader challenge, something that we believe we can make a major contribution to. As energy and Emissions Reduction Minister Angus Taylor highlighted last week, Australia has a great opportunity to make a global contribution in areas like battery storage and hydrogen technology in particular. So too, the fast-growing waste and recycling sector offers Australian firms great potential and global scale, underpinned by research strengths in the circular economy in places like the University of Sydney's Waste Transformation uh, research hub and the University of New South Wales Centre for Sustainable Materials Research and Technology. When I was in New York about this time last year, Sims Metal does all the recycling for New York, Australian company, doing a big job on a global scale. We know how to do this stuff. Our defence sector provides Australian manufacturers uh, with the opportunity to provide sophisticated defence equipment and supplies to the Australian Defence Force, but not just them but also to export to other markets and be part of global supply chains, as we've seen with the JCF, J, uh, Joint Strike Fighter project. The Defence Sovereign Industrial Capability Priorities are about targeting investment to build national capability and capacity through manufacturing. And it's backed by the National Naval Shipbuilding Plan, the Defence Export Strategy, and the $1 billion Defence Innovation Hub, and the $1.3 billion Next Generation Technologies Fund. Space opens up a further area of emerging sovereign capability where Australia is in a position to leverage close alignment between governments, the research community and industry, all under the umbrella of the Australian Space Agency, which Minister Andrews has already established down in South Australia. Space sector is estimated to reach some $1 trillion globally by 2040, and we want to be a part of that. Achieving scale in these areas and all of these areas I've just spoken about this will be a multi-year project, which is why we are taking a 10-year perspective with this plan. Immediate action will be taken, though, with additional investment, a refocusing of existing programs and deeper alignment across all parts of the manufacturing innovation system. Firstly, we will commit $52.8 million in additional funding to a second round of the successful Manufacturing Modernisation Fund, focusing on larger projects. The fund will provide grants of between $100,000 and $1 million 